This time on the Highland Woodworker. I took a bow saw and an ax and I went out in the woods and I cut down a tree and I dug it back and I made bowls. And then I made other things. From microscopic goblets to his marvelous hand mirrors, master woodturner John Lucas always thinks outside the bowl every time he approaches his loyal lathe. These two pins are going to retain the free end of my stock. Plus, bending metal always seems to be a big ordeal. Popular woodworking magazine showcases a simple solution for getting the curve you deserve. These stories and more, this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I'm here at Highland Woodworking Live Online Classroom. Be sure to check out our upcoming live classes and our archive of recorded ones. Plus, shop for the finest tools in woodworking online at highlandwoodworking.com. John Lucas is an incredibly creative woodturner who got his start where most of us did, with very little money, few resources, and a burning desire to pursue the craft. John has been working and turning wood for more than three decades and is best known for his high quality hand mirrors, smart and sentimental wood turning designs, and just happens to be the one many woodworking artists call to have their pieces professionally photographed. Let's go to John Lucas's workshop in Cookville, Tennessee and spend a moment with a master. I've always heard about the wonderment of your brain and how you translate what you're thinking about into your art. Tell us about some of these pieces here. These are amazing, John. Well, they all start with a little bit of an idea. Um, I was uh, turning natural edge bowls one day and, and somebody online had mentioned um, that the tree is born again. Well, that was just too much to pass up. So I put my little fetus in there, being born again. <laughs> That's kind of how a lot of pieces start, is I have some sort of idea that triggers a little thing and it just gets carried away. <laughs> well, here's something that definitely uh, gets you to thinking and gets you to looking. Tell us about this and the mystery. This was called Just Another Face in the Crowd and the way that started was I was going to a national symposium with a thousand pieces of art in there and I wanted to have a piece that was different that people would notice <clears throat> and I'd been studying negative spaces and, and contrast to see how they work in art and this goblet is famous drawing and I decided to actually build the goblet. Well I built it and people couldn't see the negative space so I built a box around it that made it easier to see the negative space. So you framed? Right I framed it yeah. and then I got to playing with ideas of for example, making the negative spaces on the side out of dot patterns and creating the goblet out of the negative space. I got into a battle with a man from Canada on trying to make the world's smallest goblet. And we finally gave up because the Guinness Book of World's Record wasn't interested in it. Uh, and he might have beat me anyway. He makes, as a hobby, he makes incredibly small whole scenes. But my smallest goblet is 23 thousandths of an inch tall. The stem is thinner than a human hair. Uh, that should give you some idea of how, what the size of that goblet is. You're a real artist, and I love the idea of thematic work and coming up with uh, maybe a name or a theme and then developing something that, uh, that fits that, that theme or emphasizes some aspect of, mm -hmm. of that. Uh, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, I know you have a piece somewhere. This is it. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Well, I was always always impressed with the lady, of course, and anybody on the Supreme Court. But what, in, what enticed me about it was the lace that she always wore around it. That set her apart from the other judges, aside from the fact of being a woman. And so I wanted, when she passed away, I wanted to build a little piece kind of in her honor. And that's how this piece came about. So thus the, the lace. Right, trying to figure out a way to actually make the lace. And the, you had a, maybe a forerunner? Uh, of right, this is a lot of my pieces evolve from you have an idea and you want to figure out how to make the piece 
but you don't really have the skills or you're not sure you do. So you do test pieces. And since I make hand mirrors, nine times out of 10, when I make a test piece, it's a hand mirror. So I, I, I tried this technique to see how I would make the lace of Ruth Bader Ginsburg piece and it worked out pretty well, but it told me right off the bat that I needed to space everything closer together to get the lace feel. So it was very useful in terms of a learning experience from several aspects. Well, sometimes I understand that uh, not having the, all the tools available like you really do now uh, and not having what you needed to build it with has caused you to just kind of work out of available resources and necessity. Uh, you want to tell me about that? Right. Um, I was woodworking quite a bit before I, I got laid off a bunch of jobs. And I didn't have any money. I couldn't buy wood. Uh, and it's hard to do serious woodworking like dressers and cabinets and things when you can't buy wood. Yeah. And um, I met a man named Joe Looper out at the Appalachian Center for Crafts who took me under his wing and taught me how to do green wood turning. And that was a lifesaver for me. I, I took a bow saw and an axe and I went out in the woods and I cut down a tree and I dug it back and I made bowls. And then I made other things. And then a friend uh, got out of woodworking entirely and gave me a pickup truck load of scraps that were too small to fit full of, through a planer. And I learned how to make the hand mirrors out of those scraps. And that's kind of where the hand mirrors all took off. And I, I now make, I'm known for my hand mirrors worldwide and I make hundreds of them. And yeah, that's your signature. It and is. So you even include hand mirrors as your signature and other pieces like this. Do you want to tell us about this? This was a piece. Uh, the American Association of Woodturners has an annual competition and it usually has a theme and this, the theme on this one was the 30th anniversary. And I needed to st try to somehow say this is a 30th anniversary. And I came up with the 30 pieces of silver. And so I built the cross and, and kind of that idea in my head. And while I was designing this piece, I thought I need to put a hand mirror on it so it says John Lucas. Um, and that's kind of how that whole piece came about in the long run. And so you, you turned the coins themselves or the pieces of silver? They were turned and carved. I made a pattern that I could repeat and carved them over and over and over. Yeah. There's actually only three coins on there, <laughs> but there's well, 10 there, replications of each one. Well, to follow the themes, uh, like what is the theme of this piece? That's one of the pieces I'm proud of, of most, and I hope I don't cry, but <laughs> my... Uh, Cousin had breast cancer and died of breast cancer. She'd married a black man and had two little babies. And so I designed this piece in her honor. And you'll notice there's two little goblets in there. Wow. And then keeping with that theme, I had a friend who almost died at home. She actually did die on the way to the hospital a bunch of times and had a heart transplant. And her husband had picked her up uh, to put her on the couch while he called 911. I couldn't imagine how that felt. Oh. So I designed that piece. But it took me 12 years to build that piece because you can't buy, you can't get wood to bend at this 90 degree arc like that. And I tried all kinds of bending methods and I finally came up with a wood called uh, compressed wood and it would bend, but it didn't have any spalting. So to match the spalting of the top and bottoms, all this has been airbrushed or hand painted to create the spalting lines. Wow. I love the delicate uh, Christmas decorations or ornaments that, that you turn. Uh, with the long finials and uh, just beautiful. Well, a man named Bob Roseanne taught me how to make Christmas ornaments. And I don't like to do, I don't like to copy anybody else's work. I might make one or two to learn how to do it. But after that, I have to change it to make it my own. And so over the years, I've probably done, gosh, I don't know, 30 or more variations of Christmas ornaments. Um, and uh, the current ones that I'm doing, there was an article in American Association of Woodturners magazine on how to use a router to make these little cuts in the lathe. So everyone kind of starts again with a theme similar to the others in that you're trying to figure out how to go to the next step. And when I teach wood routing on the lathe, I have all kinds of little jigs I built for the lathe itself to hold the router or help guide the router. And that lets me get the kind of cuts that I want and the accuracy that I want. We've had some great pictures uh, done by just the best woodworkers uh, in the world on our show. We didn't realize that the person who took those pictures is also the person I'm standing with here today. Uh, tell us about your life as a woodworking photographer. 
Well, I became a photographer, uh, found a job at Tennessee Tech as a, as a photographer for the university. And part of that job was photographing artwork for the Appalachian Center for Crafts. And I got good at it. So artists from all over the southeast were coming to me to get photographs made of their artwork because I was helping to get them into the high-end shows. And I loved it. I loved the artwork. I loved talking to the artists. So it was a lot of fun for me, and I hope it was fun for them. <laughs> well, and you also started uh, getting calls to uh, come teach fine woodworking photography and to do some articles. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, well, I get invited to a lot of the woodworking sympo wood turning symposiums. Uh, usually they'll have me do at least one class on photography. Um, and then I've, I've traveled around, taught photography, taught demos to different clubs on photography. Uh, and I've written at least three or four articles for different magazines on photography. Wow. Photographing well, artwork, I should say. I start my classes on the very basics. So we talk, and I try to use lighting that everybody can afford. I don't use expensive lighting. Uh, the idea is just to give the artist a chance, if they can't afford to pay a photographer, a living chance to photograph their own work and get it in there. So we start with the basics of just telling everybody how and where to focus, you know, what color lighting to use, how to use a background. We try to get you through the basics just so you get a, a good photograph because it's so important right now to get into any art shows to have a high quality photograph because that's all you're judged by is the photo. Well, John, uh, you've got your art that you express through uh, uh, wood turning. You've got your photography. Uh, what inspired a young John Lucas to be able to do all this? Well, I have to look back. I wanted to be an architect. I ate, slept, and breathed Frank Lloyd Wright when I was growing up. And unfortunately, I was really lousy at math. <laughs> so when I got to college, that was not an option. Uh, I had gotten into photography while I was doing that. Um, so that was just kind of a, a background hobby. While I was in the Air Force, uh, I got into photography much deeper because they had a dark room we could use. And so I learned more about that. Um, and I did a little bit of woodworking while I was in uh, the Air Force, we just, they had a shop and you could go down there and play a little bit. Um, it was sort of a background. When I got to college, I started taking photography classes and I was a physical education major and I took a lot of industrial arts classes. So I took some more woodworking and metalworking classes and things like that and that just sort of enhanced the craft end, I guess, of what I'm doing. Uh, and it just gradually grew from all of that. The photography got deeper, the woodworking got deeper and I didn't know it was going to go this far. <laughs> How would you like to be remembered? Uh, what do you think your work is going to do for how you're remembered? Wow, that's interesting. I don't know, because I don't know which end to follow. I would love to think somewhere along the line, I've tried to make my mirrors affordable, and somewhere along the line I would like to think there are just hundreds and hundreds of mirrors out there that everybody has one of my mirrors. But I think it's probably more important, I think my legacy would be more as a teacher. That's what I enjoy doing. I like teaching people how to woodwork so they can enjoy the hobbies that I've enjoyed. Same thing with photography. I like teaching it. I like helping people along with it. So I think I'd rather be known as a teacher as much as uh, having the artwork out there. Coming up, we'll head back to John Lucas's Tennessee workshop to see his hand mirror turning methods in action. But first, Popular Woodworking Magazine shows us why you don't have to be a superhero to bend metal superbly in your shop. Don't go anywhere. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs. Easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, 
and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside router bits best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a white side router bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. I've been using Forest products for years. You know, they're the maker of the Woodworker 2 saw blade. Gives great cuts on your table saw every time. Now, I have a chop master for my miter saw. I have a dense piece of two by two walnut, and as you see, it cuts like butter, leaving clean cuts at 90 degrees. Forest, the cuts will make you smile every time. All woodworkers and homeowners eventually need to do a little bit of metal work. Recently on the Whitsmith Shop television show set, we made this stool which needed these steel brackets for the base. Well, to help you out, I've got a tool here I'd like to introduce you to. It's the Shop Notes Scroll Bending Jig. This is a jig I designed many, many years ago and it's turned out to be a great shop helper. So let me walk you through it. The jig itself consists of a simple square of plywood giving you four locations to securely clamp it to the bench. On the top, you'll find rows of holes, and these holes fit pins for these forming dies. There are also additional holes which will retain the free end of the metal as we bend it. Now, the different types of metal you can use with this jig, aluminum, brass, steel, round, square, rectangular, Lots of options. To use the jig, I'm going to use a form which matches the desired radius. These two pins are going to retain the free end of my stock. From there, it's just a simple matter of wrapping, of wrapping around the form. If I want to do a reverse bend, I can use these same retaining pins and go in the opposite direction. So with the shop nut scroll bending jig, you're going to get results that are consistent, and that's important when making multiples. One thing you might notice, these retaining pins have a certain distance in between them, and with each set, it increases in distance. And that's just to accommodate different sizes of stock. So let's move the pins over to a new location, and I'm going to select a different forming die, and this is a square piece of steel, and you can see it's going to fit in between these pins, but it would not have fit between this other location. And so with that, I can easily bend this around. And so by having the pins with different spacings, we accommodate all sorts of different materials. When you go to bend some scroll work, it's always a good idea to have a paper pattern which to compare your work with. Many times you may need to bend a little more or take a little out of a bend to match the pattern. But by using that pattern, you know you're going to get good, consistent results. And so, the Shop Notes Scroll Bending Jig. It's a great shop helper, it's going to make your work easier, and it may open up a whole new line of things to add to your woodwork. Coming up, turning a square block into a round mirror. 
John Lucas shows us how it's done. Stick around. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Meet the Bora Centipede, the lightweight and portable workshop table that supports up to 3,000 pounds, stores in a small space for tight shops, and opens into a work table to bring your work to a comfortable height. This makes the perfect companion for your track saw. Comes with X cups and hold downs to secure your work. Just add the Boro workbench top and you've got a great auxiliary table anywhere in your shop. Upgrade your shop today. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading bandsaws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon power tools. Well, this is the magic moment when my masterpiece or your masterpiece comes in contact with masterpiece wood finish oil. It just comes alive. This is a great piece of wood and it's going to just look brilliant. Masterpiece Wood Finish causes your masterpiece. If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Let Highland's legendary wood slicer resaw blade help make it easy for you to get great results sawing thick lumber into thinner boards. The wood slicer is designed to cut much faster, smoother, and quieter than ordinary bandsaw blades. You'll be amazed at how smooth a surface you'll get with a wood slicer. Its variable tooth pattern greatly reduces noise and vibration. Order a wood slicer from Highland Woodworking for your bandsaw today. Well, we're back in John's shop and John's going to show us how he makes uh, what turns out to be one of his signature items, the hand mirror. Uh, I can't wait to find out how you do it. Well, it's a lot of fun, and what I'm going to do, uh, I start off uh, turning what's going to be the opening for the glass, and then I turn it around, hold it, and turn the back side. And uh, a lot of people ask me, why don't you knock the square corners off first? Well, I use the square corners as a test piece. I don't always know what kind of wood this is, or how it turns, and how it cuts. And by leaving the square corners on there, I'm going to waste those away anyway. So it gives me a chance to learn how that wood is cutting and how my tool is working. So we'll turn that up fairly high. Now, I'm cutting mostly air right here. And, and you'll probably notice, I hope, I use my body to do all my turning. I can control the tool very accurately that way. So it lets me cut quickly and cleanly. I'm not taking too large of a bite, so I won't tear it off accidentally. So what I'm trying to do as I'm cutting on this, I'm going to rotate the gouge slightly one way or the other to feel how the wood cuts, how the gouge cuts, and what I'm trying to learn to do is what is the best cut. And then I can put the gouge on top and it's bouncing so it's not round yet. And these are kind of rough cuts. I'm cutting fairly quickly. I got one little flat spot there and there and there. Okay, close. All I'm trying to do is just kind of get it rough to size. 
so I know where I'm at. And what I'm going to do, I slowed down the cut on this pass. I wanted to see how that wood is cutting and how my tool's cutting, and it's cutting fairly clean. I haven't sharpened this one lately, so maybe I should. I always sharpen many times during each project. I just want to face this off and get it flat. I'm going to do a push cut at this point. Get that flat. Then I use a little tool that I made to mark my mirror opening. And then we'll take a parting tool. I need to back my tool rest off just a little bit. So I moved the tool rest back because my parting tool's got this little bevel and I don't want to be sitting on the bevel. <coughs> and what I do is I, I push that in a little bit to get started and then I'll take my bowl gouge and I'll rough it out just to kind of waste away some material. Once I get that wasted away, I'll use it as a push cut, clean it up. The push cut cuts cleaner than that other method I was using, but the other method's faster. And then what I do is I test it real quick with this little gauge, and it barely, barely fits. I also have a little pin right there. It shows me that the depth is almost deep enough, but not quite. So we'll go back and we'll make it just a little deeper. And I'm going to make it just a tiny bit wider. Change tools and go back here and clean this up. Now it doesn't matter the finish on this part because it's all under the glass. So I can go a little faster and leave some tool marks and it won't matter. Okay, this fits real snugly. That's the size of my glass. Then I use a tool a little bit differently than some people do. It's a spindle gouge. And what I do is <clears throat> the wood moves, the glass doesn't move. So if I put the mirror in there and it's a real snug fit and winter comes along and this wood shrinks, it can actually break the glass or it'll break the wood. And so what I do is I do an undercut. I put this in there like that and I rotate the tool. And that lower lip cuts away the bottom. And then I come out and I kind of scrape this clean. Then I'll go back and go the other way. Clean that up. Now I want to check it one more time to make sure I've got just a little bit of slop. Now what it does is the glass will barely fit in there, which makes a nice looking appearance. But if the wood shrinks or contracts, the wood actually goes around the glass and it won't hurt it. So once we get that part cleaned up, I go back to my bowl gouge and I want to shape this part. I want to shape that round edge. Um, I can do it a number of ways, but what I'm doing now is I start off with that bottom edge. I'm rubbing the bevel. It's not cutting. I rotate until it starts to cut, and I pull it around, and I lift the handle up, and now it becomes a push cut, and I'm cutting that outside, and I don't have to go all the way because I'm going to waste the rest of it later, and I've got a little bit of a, a rough cut there. So we'll clean that up a little bit. Take, take my time. There we go. Just letting the wood tell me how it wants to cut. I don't want to force the cut. If you force it, it tears out. And you want nice clean work because I don't want to have to sand all that. This is a little rough wood. It's a little rough right there, a little rough right there. Um, I can go back and do what's called shear scraping and clean that up a little bit. Just get rid of the tool marks and any little touch up. And now that would be ready to sand. John, this is a great reflection of your wonderful work. Uh, and I, I like the way that you take small bits of wood that are all around us if you're a woodworker and you use them to conserve uh, their beauty and make a, a, just a great object that anyone would like to have, even as a gift. I was at one of the, the woodworking stores one day and I uh, happened to see this one by 12 that I was gonna make shelves out of. And as soon as I saw that pattern, I realized that piece is not gonna be shelves, it's gonna be mirrors. 
Well, it's all around us and it's available to make something great out of it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Why should you choose fish forstner bits to drill your flat bottom holes? Well, let's look at kind of a value forstner bit here. Uh, it's got a straight edge and after a very short time, it's not going to cut a precise hole. In fact, it could destroy or lift the grain around the hole, which you'll have to spend lots of time fixing. Well, this is the fish Forstner bit, and look at the patented wave edge here. That's gonna give you a beautiful uh, side of the hole uh, time after time after time. In fact, you can sharpen these up to 30 times and still have a precision cut. And it's got a nice brad point in the middle and will give you a nice flat bottom to your hole. And that's what you want. Now, this collection here has uh, 16 uh, wave cutter fish forstner bits, starting with a quarter of an inch all the way up to two and an eighth of an inch. Uh, again, it's a lifetime purchase. Um, You've got a nice wooden box that comes in and they're all fitted to their particular location and protected. That's very important for these cutting edges. With a value priced Forstner bit, you really need to use a drill press, but I'm going to use a cordless drill here and I'm going to drill a hole. Show you what a beautiful job. You Now that is nice. Look at the beautiful quality of that hole. That's the fish wave cutter design. That is quality. And when I think of quality, I think of fish. That will make you smile. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that's all the time we have left for this episode. Don't forget to follow us on our social media channels. Until next time. I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland woodworker.